Hi, and welcome back to Allen High School's discussion of structure and function. And we're focusing right now on mixtures, and in particular, moving into ionic and molecular covalent, that discrete covalent. Uh, network covalent and metals are not soluble at all in water. So we're not going to focus on their solubility, um, but we will focus on ionics covalence along with the gaseous covalence. Now let's start with ionics. Remember it takes to break and so if we're going to dissolve and here's a good representation this shows the particles and remember we have partially positive down on the end by the hydrogens and partially negative by the oxygens partially positive, partially negatives. You should be able to draw that, including those partial positive charges. Remember, you have to be able to draw representations. Okay, and interpret, draw and interpret. So if we're going to dissolve an ionic, we, a few things have to happen. First, we have to break the ion-ion electrostatic attraction. Remember, that's the lattice energy. And so we would have to, or what would have to be accomplished, is breaking that attraction between the positive and negative in order to get it to dissolve. Ooh, random thought. Remind me to show you a video of this because there, I've got a really good video showing solubility and I think it'll help us a lot on that. Um, so you guys have to be my little reminder there. You know I, I'm forgetful. Okay, so that's something that has to be broken and it takes to break, takes energy to break. It'll take energy to actually break and sometimes this is neglected a little bit, but I think it's an important consideration. You have to break the hydrogen bonding, dipole, dipole, London dispersion, attractions, you know, all the different attractions in water. So let me, I want to do it this way instead. Um, ah, Dina, last little ion, ion, you have that. The hydrogen bonding along with dipole, dipole, and London dispersion. And I know we tend to think of hydrogen bonding as super dipole, but it's a little bit more than that, all right? Because if we're going to make room for the water to interact with the ion, we have to break the attractions between two waters. So that frees them up to be attracted with the ion. And so that's where we get our freeze to form. We're going to have form a cation to the partial negative. And notice it's not the partial negative on one water molecule. It's the partial negative on a bunch of water molecules. This is a hydration okay, process that is surrounding the ions, where water completely surrounds it, multiple molecules. Okay, so that freeing to form is more than just one. That formation is the forming of many attractions here. Okay, and I know that's getting a little messy. Let's clean that up a little bit. Okay. So, and then we also form the anion to the, and that's attracted to the partial positive, and that's what we're showing right here is this attraction here. And again, it's not just one attraction that's forming and freeing up that energy in the process. It's, it's a series of attractive forces as the water surrounds the anion. So, if the balance is favorable, if the lattice energy, the, the breaking, is less than what's freed, so it's kind of like you got to spend some money. So if the money that we're going to spend is less than the money that we make, then it's going to be a profitable. So it takes to break. So the energy it takes to break the lattice is less than what is freed from this um, solvation. It, it's going to be a net gain, and it will be soluble. Okay. Now, I'm talking about this solely on the process of energetics. There is another effect uh, um, that has to do with randomness called the entropy. And we're not going to talk about that till towards the end of the year. So for now, we're just going to simplify it and just talk about the balance of energetics. Okay? So 
that's ionics. What about covalence? Here's what we're doing here in attractions. This is a, maybe a general way to describe it. Again, you have to be able to draw these types of interactions. So this would maybe be showing some molecule with just a simple dipole moment. And the partial negative on water is attracted to the partial positive on the dipole moment of the other molecule, whatever that polar molecule is. Now, what this is showing is the formation of a hydrogen bond because alcohols have an H to an O and we end up with a partial positive here and a partial negative that can be attracted. We also end up with a partial negative here that could attract another water molecule. So it can be a series of attractions there. All right. And again, I ask you to do this in your homework because you have to be able to draw that some way. Okay, again, I, m I mentioned that. So the balance is typically favorable. So we're looking at that balance, that freeze to form versus takes to break, right? And if the freeze to form is greater than what it takes to break, it's a win, right? You make money, so to speak. Now, I'm simplifying this quite a bit, but it gives you a start of understanding the structural reason why things dissolve, all right? So the balance is favorable, typically, you know, at least somewhat exothermic, not always, but typically exothermic, for polar solutes in polar solvents. It takes a lot of energy to break apart the interactions between the solute. It takes a lot of energy to break apart a polar solvent, but you get, you free a lot when you form, okay? And um, the, the balance is typically favorable, typically exothermic or not too endothermic for nonpolar, nonpolar. And that's what you have to talk about. You can't just say the phrase, like dissolves like. Like dissolves like is an observation that an eighth grader can make. When the eighth grader tries to put water into oil and it's immiscible, we can say it doesn't dissolve because water is polar and oil is nonpolar. Um, if we put vinegar into water, we can say, oh, like dissolves like, they dissolved. That's an observation. That is not a justification or an explanation of what is happening down at the molecular level. What we're talking about is the balance of taking to break and freeing to form. Okay. Now, the balance is typically unfavorable or endothermic. If you have a polar solute which takes a lot of energy to break, and nonpolar solvents, which take a little energy to break. But here's the deal. The attraction between a dipole and a London dispersion, this is a very weak attraction. So that free to form in this case, I'm trying to say this a lot so you really get it in your mind that energy is freed when you form attractions. This is going to be quite small. And it's not going to be nearly enough to overcome what's needed to break solute-solute interactions. And this is true here, unfavorable. Okay, so this is not enough, all right? That, I won't accept it, nor will AP accept it. It's okay, you can make the statement, but then you have to explain why like dissolves like in terms of the taking to break it takes to break apart solute attractions. It takes to break apart solvent attractions. And then we free to form your solute solvent attractions. Okay? You have to talk about it in terms of those energetics. Okay? Now, um, I want a, a quick word on what happens with molecules that have both polar and nonpolar regions. So in this case, we have an ethanol. This is a polar end, but the hydrocarbons are nonpolar. Now, this is soluble in water. 
Now look what happens. We still have our polar end here, but as we add to that hydrocarbon chain, that nonpolar contribution becomes significant and it ceases to become soluble. So it would be not soluble. If, if they were both liquids, we would say they were immiscible. You should know that term. And, and that's why, do you, do you remember the concept in biology of micelles? And this is actually the reason why bilayers in a membrane are the way they are. Because the polar parts want to be out by the aqueous-based solvent. Okay, and then the nonpolar tails, those long hydrocarbon tails, are more attracted to one another as a whole, and so they stay together. And that's a very poor drawing of a, of a lipid bilayer. <laughs> okay, but hopefully you get the idea. All right, and this would be a micelle. You might have heard that term. That's how detergents work because you have this nonpolar interior and that's going to capture the oil. And then the polar exterior will be carried along with the water. And so that's how we you know, pull dirt away um, from molecules. And this kind of shows the phospholipids that I was talking about here. This would be the polar region of your phospholipid, so that would be on the outside of the bilayer. Okay. These are the nonpolar hydrocarbon tails, and they're going to be on the interior. Okay. So I wanted to make that link to biochemistry because chemistry is life and biochemistry is a blast. All right. Okay, in our final video of this series, and, and that's it, day four won't have videos, we're going to start reviewing for the test and preparing for our mock exam. Um, but I do briefly want to talk about how we separate those mixtures. So until then... This is, as always, signing off.